as the very first thing, <clears throat> I'd like to express my delight in that all of you have come here for the purpose of discovering knowledge about the Dhamma in order to use that understanding in living one's life so that one will receive the highest benefits from life. When speaking about Dhamma, we must deal with many profound matters. Therefore, we need to use, find a time that is appropriate for considering profound things. This is why we have chosen this time. This time of day is a time that is fitting for Dhamma, which is profound. And so we choose a time when the mind is fit for understanding Dhamma. This is a time of day when the mind is still appropriate or fit. That means it's fresh. The mind is fresh right now, and it's still calm and peaceful. The mind is also active. It has a readiness, an activeness, with which it can investigate and understand the Dhamma. So don't, please don't think that asking you to come here at this time is just to give you a rough time. We've chosen this time not to make things difficult for you, but because of the appropriateness of this time of day. And so it's an old tradition in Buddhism that Buddhists will use this kind of day, this time of day, in order to learn about Dhamma, in order to think about Dhamma, and in order to practice Dhamma. In terms of nature, this is the time of day when many flowers begin to open. The flowers bloom and send their fragrances spreading through the world. It's the time of day when animals wake up. For example, the roosters crowing at this time of day as the animals wake up and start to go about their duties. And most important, this is the time of day in which the Buddha awakened. The great awakening of the Buddha happened at this time of day. And so this time is quite appropriate for us who wish to study that which the Buddha discovered and taught, namely the Dhamma. Most of you are familiar with the word dharma or dhamma. Many of you have heard this word before and are quite familiar with it. But there's another word that few of you are aware of or know much about. And this is the word dhammika, dhammika or dharmika. So we'd like to spend this morning's talk trying to develop the best understanding of this word dhammika as we can. Many of, some of you may have come across the anglicized form of the word which is dharmic, dharmic with an I-C at the end. This is from the Sanskrit form, dharmic, and it's very close to the word dhammika, dhammika. The word dhammika or dharmic means to be made up with or made up through, made through, made by dhamma. This is very important. It means that 
the Dhamma is with us, is in us, in our flesh and blood and bones. This is the meaning of Dhammika. The Dhamma is in the Dhamma itself. But if it isn't Dhammika, if the Dhamma isn't with us and in us, in our flesh and blood, then of what use is the Dhamma to us? We all talk a lot about life. By life we mean this body and mind, the body-mind um, integration or process. But we often don't stop to notice whether this life is composed of Dhamma or not, whether these bodies and minds are compo composed of Dhamma or integrated with and through Dhamma. When life is integrated with Dhamma, composed of Dhamma, then we call it Chivita Dhammika or Dharmic life. Now this dharmic life is hidden. It doesn't express itself so obviously in our lives, especially in the lives of ordinary people. You can't see much of the dharmic life. It's kind of hidden. Or you could say that God has made it a mystery or a secret and hasn't yet revealed the Dhammic life to us. So we need to act in such a way. We need to do whatever is necessary to express this Dharmic life so that in our ordinary lives, in all of our actions, words, and thoughts, there is the expression of Dharmic life. Or we can say that this kind of life is hidden. It has been hidden until the Buddha discovered it. And upon discovering the Dhammic life, then revealed it, made it available to, to others. So through the Buddha, the Dhammic life was no longer hidden became something open and realizable by us. Now ordinarily the word Dhamma means everything. Dhamma means thing or things, including all things. But here, the way we're using it when we speak of Dhammika, Dhamma means the correctness. It means correctness, the correctness of everything that we need. The correctness of all the things we need is what we mean by Dhammika or Dhamma in this case. Now when we speak of everything, we mean everything connected or related to nature. When we speak of Dhamma being everything, we mean all the things that are part of nature, connected with nature, related to nature. And when we speak of Dhamma in terms of nature, there are four basic meanings to the word. Please listen carefully so that you can make some understanding about this. The first meaning of Dhamma here then is nature itself. All the phenomena which make up nature, what we could call the body of nature. This is the first meaning of Dhamma. The second meaning is the law of nature. The law that governs all the natural things, all the natural phenomena that governs how they come together, how they function together, how they operate. 
this law that governs or controls the way all things happen is called the law of nature. The third meaning of Dhamma is the correct duty or the duty which is correct in accordance with that law of nature. And the fourth meaning are the fruits or effects that come from doing that duty. So therefore when we speak of correctness we mean correct in accordance with nature, correct in line with the law of nature, correct according to the duty according to the law of nature, and correct in terms of the fruits that come from doing that duty. This is what we mean by correctness. So for something to be correct in terms of Dhamma, it must be correct in terms of these four meanings of Dhamma. It must be correct in terms of nature, correct in terms of the law of nature, correct in terms of the duty that must be done in line with the law of nature, and correct in terms of the natural fruits and results of doing that duty as stipulated by the law of nature or as required by the law of nature. To understand what is correct, to understand correctness or rightness, we must understand these four meanings of Dhamma. In the Pali language, we don't have the word Dhammachati or Tamacha, which is the Thai word for nature. This word doesn't exist in the Pali language. There's just the word Dhamma. But when it is Tamachati or born from Dhamma, then it must also be Dhamma. And something is truly Dhamma or Dhammika when it is correct when it is perfect in line with these four meanings of Dhamma. So Dhamma is about being correct and Dhammika means this correctness in accordance with Dhamma. And so to use the term dhammika, it, we must have the correctness in terms with the four meanings of nature, which we have been discussing. I'd like to take the opportunity right now to discuss how this fits with the religions that have a god, the theistic religions. How does this discussion of Dhamma and nature fit with the, the ways of speaking of the theistic religions with their gods? Nature is the same as that which God has created, namely the creation of God. Or you could say that nature is the physical body of God. Nature is the body of God on the physical level. And then the law of nature is the spiritual aspect of God. God on the, in spiritual terms, or the spiritual aspect of God is the law of nature. Or if we make put it a little more clearly, we can speak of it as being the will of God, the, the will, the hope of God is the same as the law of nature. Third is that which we must do 
that which we must perform or practice according to the will of God, which can be called prayer, the prayer of God, which is the response, the wholehearted response to the will of God. This corresponds to the duty that is required by the law of nature. And then the, the last one is the grace of God, that which God bestows upon us. The grace of God corresponds with the natural fruits of doing the duty required by the law of nature. But there are two aspects to this, this fruit. There's the kind of grace which nobody calls grace, but it's still a kind of grace. When we act incorrectly regarding the duty required by the natural law, then in a very just way, God punishes us with dukkha. This is a form of grace, but since nobody likes dukkha, they don't speak of it as being grace. The other kind of fruit arises when one correctly performs the duty according to the will of God. And then the fruits are those which are satisfying, which we, we recognize readily as being grace. So one can see that these four natural principles can be used both with the theistic religions and the non-theistic religions. Whether religions speak in terms of God or in terms of nature and natural law, we can find that these same four principles are prominent and central in any religion. Therefore, we can say that all religions have God. All religions have God. But many modern scholars consider Buddhism as being atheistic. They speak of Buddhism as not having a God. The scholars who categorize things in this way do so out of ignorance. Their eyes are shut, and so they don't know what Buddhism is about, and they make their little categories because they, they don't understand Buddhism. It's not a matter of Buddhism not having a god. It's just that some, of these, some people don't understand that there are two kinds of god. There's the personal god and the impersonal god. The so-called theistic religions have a personal God. And then the so-called natural religions or atheistic religions have an impersonal God. But if we look more carefully, we see that all religions have God. And especially when we view them in terms of these four natural principles, then we see that it's pretty much the same God. This being the case, there's no more need for religions to compete, to argue, to convert each other, and to go through all their wasteful struggles. Since all religions have the same God, they ought to accept this fact and learn to work together for their own good and the good of life. The impersonal God cannot be understood by those people of weak intelligence. Peoples whose intelligence or wisdom is poorly developed or immature cannot understand the impersonal God. One must have a well-developed, mature um, wisdom faculty what used to be called the intellect, 
if one is to understand the impersonal God. For those whose intellect or wisdom is still weak and underdeveloped, then there is the personal God, which is in very personal terms, and so it's easy for even children to understand. Therefore, when we speak about God and religious matters, we have two ways of speaking. There is the language of Dhamma, which doesn't speak in personal terms. It speaks in impersonal, natural terms. And then there is the, lang the people language, the personal language, that speaks of God in personal or humanistic, anthropomorphic terms. One has to be careful to distinguish between these two ways of speaking if one is going to have a true understanding of God. It's rather amusing that even in the, the age of science, there are still many people whose intellect and wisdom is quite weak and immature. If one has a correct understanding of science, is one, if one is a real scientist, then it's easy to understand the impersonal God. But for those who don't really understand science, although living in the scientific age, they still have this problem of not understanding the impersonal God. And so it's rather amusing that even in such scientific times, there are a great many people whose intellect or wisdom is weak, we could even say retarded. If one has a genuine understanding of Dhamma, it's quite simple to explain and understand the four meanings of Dhamma. And if one understands these four meanings of Dhamma, then one will have a correct understanding of science in terms of religion. One would correctly understand the religious or spiritual side of science. So therefore, if we are to have a mature and thorough understanding of science, we must not overlook the spiritual aspect or the science of religion. And therefore we need to understand the four meanings of nature, of Dhamma. So let's consider the meanings, the meanings of the word Dhammika once again, because the word Dhammika in fact has quite a few meanings. So Dhammika means, first of all, to know the Dhamma, to understand the Dhamma in all four of its meanings. And further, Dhammika means to practice correctly according to nature, to practice and live correctly towards and regarding nature. The second meaning of Dhammika is to practice the Dhamma correctly. When one knows and understands the Dhamma, then one is able to practice it correctly, to respond correctly to nature. And when one practices the Dhamma correctly, then one is Dhammika on an even higher level. Through, through practicing it. Just to know the Dhamma but unable to practice it is not enough. Understanding it, we have to be able to practice. The third meaning of Dhammika is to have Dhamma, to possess Dhamma. That means that the Dhamma is in one's flesh and blood. It's in one's body and soul. There is, 
dhamma in one's body, dhamma in one's mind. One has the spirit of dhamma. When one has the dhamma in all aspects and thoroughly, this is an even higher meaning of dhammika. In the Pali language, there is a phrase which conveys the meaning of this quite well. It can be translated as to bathe in the flavor of dhamma. To bathe in the flavor of dhamma until one is is wet through and through, is soaked, until one is soaked or permeated by dhamma. To bathe in the flavor of dhamma until thoroughly permeated or soaked by it is this third meaning of dhammika. Even higher than that is to drink the dhamma, to drink or imbibe the dhamma. Or we can even say to eat, to partake of the dhamma, which by this we mean to deeply experience the dhamma both physically and mentally. When we experience the dhamma on all levels, deeply, this is an even higher meaning of dhammika. Now because the dhamma is something mental or spiritual, it is experienced by mind. And so there's a phrase in the Pali scriptures which goes to drink the flavor of Dhamma through the Nama Gaya. Nama Gaya, Gaya means group, collection, or body. And Nama means here immaterial or mental. And so this means, Nama Gaya means the collection of all mental things or of all, all the minds functions and activities. And so the mind in all its aspects, in all its functions, all its whatevers, drinks the Dhamma. And so we have the Dhamma, we bathe in the flavor of Dhamma, we, and we drink or imbibe the Dhamma with the Namakaya. This is the fullest meaning of Dhammika, the perfection of Dhammika. Life that is Dhammika, as we have described, is what we call Dharmic life. But life that doesn't have much to do with Dhamma, or doesn't have anything to do with Dhamma, is called non dhammic life. We ought to be careful to understand the difference between dharmic life and non dharmic life. So you should ask yourself, you should look at yourself asking, do we have dharmic life or non dharmic life? Is this life of ours right here? Ask yourself this, dharmic or non-dharmic? Now, all of you have come here in search of what we call dhamma. Although that may not be true for a few of you, it's our belief that all of you have come here in search of dhamma. But once you've gotten some Dhamma, the question is, what do you intend to do with it? Some of you may intend merely to take the Dhamma to teach others. That you're here just to learn some things that you can pass on to others. But we would like to recommend <coughs> that you have the fullest meaning of dhammika, 
that you not just learn the Dhamma to pass on to others, but you practice it until it's in your blood and in your bones, not to mention your, not to mention your brain. And then when one has thoroughly integrated the Dhamma within oneself, then there won't be any more problems. One won't, won't have to worry about what to teach others. If you understand these four principles or meanings of Dhamma, then it isn't really necessary for you to come here. If you understand these four principles, you can study and practice the Dhamma anywhere. You could study it in the science classroom or in the scientific laboratory. You'll know how to investigate and practice Dhamma according to these four principles. You can practice Dhamma in any religion because every religion contains these four principles. You can practice the Dhamma anywhere once you understand these four principles. Now some people ask why you should come here, why you ought to come here. And our response is, the reason for coming here is to learn the method, the way for realizing the Dhamma. Once you know how to do it, you can do it anywhere. But the problem is when we don't yet know how to go about investigating, discovering and realizing the Dhamma, then you ought to come here because we can help you to understand the way or method for realizing the Dhamma. If, if this is what interests you, then this is the place to come. But let us emphasize that once you know the, we the method or way, you can put it into practice anywhere. You don't have to stay here for the rest of your life. And let us remind you that if you understand the four meanings of Dhamma, if you really understand them, you'll know how to, how to practice and discover the Dhamma for yourself. We might as well take the, the time to deal with another um, difficulty or question some people have. This is the distinction between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. And some people have the question or problem which way should we follow? <clears throat> should we follow the Mahayana path or the Theravada path? One needs to recognize in order to solve this question that there are many kinds of people in the world. There are the people with weak or retarded, retarded intellect and those with a well-developed, vigorous intellect. For those of weak or immature understanding and wisdom, there needs to be developed many ways to interest them and help them along. This is what Mahayana Buddhism has done. Mahayana Buddhism is, has figured out all kinds of rituals, ceremonies, chants, and practices for all the different varieties of people in the world whose intellects or wisdom faculties are not highly developed. But for those whose wisdom faculty is already vigorous and daring, then Theravada Buddhism is sufficient because it contains the essentials without any needless complications or um, proliferation. Now, also, please don't waste any time 
trying to figure out whether you ought to study Indian Buddhism or Sri Lankan Buddhism or Burmese Buddhism or Thai Buddhism or Japanese Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or what have you. Don't waste your time getting lost in such unimportant distinctions. But look carefully and see that there is only one Buddhism. The reality is that there is only one Buddhism, which is the truth of the four meanings of Dhamma. Once you see that this is the one Buddhism, these four meanings of Dhamma, then you won't have these problems about whether to be a Thai Buddhist or a Burmese Buddhist or a Japanese Buddhist or whatever. If you wanted to learn about all these different forms of Buddhism, it would cost you a lot of time and money. You'd have to spend a lot of money buying all kinds of books on Sri Lankan Buddhism, Burmese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Mongolian Buddhism, Bhutanese Buddhism, Nepali Buddhism, and on and on and on. And in the end, you'd have a warehouse of books, but you wouldn't know beans about Dhamma. You would have read all these books and probably would be more confused than when you began with. And in, in, in the end, even if you fly off to all these countries, in the end, all you know is a lot of miscellaneous details about the Buddhism, the different forms of practices and rituals and ceremonies and things that have been developed for the weak-minded people or people of weakly developed wisdom faculties. Or you will have learned the little details that have been of specific applications of the Dhamma in different times and places. That would be the most you could get out of it, the, the spe certain specific applications which probably aren't relevant or applicable to you anyway. And you won't have gotten to the real heart or to the life itself of Dhamma. If you really want to realize the Dhamma, <coughs> then study these four meanings of Dhamma. Sit yourself down someplace. It doesn't have to be here, it can be at home, it can be anywhere. Sit yourself down and study these four meanings of Dhamma. Study these four principles within yourself, within these two meter long bodies more or less, together with consciousness and experience, study the Dhamma there, study all four meanings of Dhamma in your own living conscious bodies. That's all you have to do. You needn't clutter yourself up with all the little details and miscellaneous techniques that have been created to help those who are of weak intellect. If you have sufficient understanding, then all you need to do is sit down and study these four meanings of Dhamma within one's living body. Nature is these bodies every cell in these bodies, all the groups of cells, and then the, when the, the cells and groups of cells come together to form organs and the different parts of the body. Nature are all, all of these cells and organs and parts of the body, as well as the mind all the thoughts, feelings, experiences. And so this body-mind, this mind-body, that, that is what we mean by nature. This is what we study in the first meaning of Dhamma. The second meaning of Dhamma is the law of nature. 
In every cell one can discover the law of nature. Every cell is created by the law of nature and governed by the law of nature. The functioning of each cell, the way the cells cooperate and work together to form organs, all of this is under the power of the law of nature. The way these organs function, the functioning of, say, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, the functioning of all these organs is totally under the law of nature. So one can study the law of nature in all these things which are governed by the law of nature, all the physical and mental things within this living body. Until one, and one can ask oneself, is there anything that is above the power of the law of nature? Until one finds that which is above the law of nature. In this way, one can study the second meaning of Dhamma within these living conscious bodies. The third meaning is the duty that is required by natural law. When there is the natural law in every cell governing every function of every cell and part of the body, then it's inevitable that there will be the duties. And so each cell has its duty or function to perform according to natural law. When the cells form organs, then each organ has its function or duty that must be performed according to the law of nature. The breathing of the lungs, the pumping of blood by the heart, the work of the liver, the kidneys, the brain, and all the other parts of the body, all of these have their duty, their function. And so we can study this meaning of Dhamma in all the parts of our bodies, seeing the functions that they must perform because of the law of nature. And then there are the functions or duties that we must do. We need to eat to feed these bodies. We must bathe these bodies. We must exercise them. There are all the duties we have going so far as having to go to school and learn certain things, learn skills and knowledge so that we can get a job and earn a living in order to take care of ourselves. There are all these different kinds of duties and all of them come from the law of nature. So we can study this third principle in all the necessary functions and duties of these living bodies and minds. And then there is the fourth meaning of Dhamma, the fruits, the results of performing that duty that needs to be done according to natural law. The results are always happening. Sometimes they're excessive, sometimes they're deficient. The results depend on how we do the duties. And so we can discover, we can investigate the results, the fruits of the various duties. We can see that in some ways they are too much, in other ways not enough. And this comes from how we perform the duties. Nowadays, there's quite a few things that tend to be excessive. Rather than living in a way which is sufficient, which is good enough, which is correct, we tend to indulge in excess. It's a very excessive world nowadays. For example, we like to eat too much, too much in a way that it's not very good for us. And so we, we often lack good health, well-being, comfort, joy, because of so much in our life is excessive. 
we dress up too much. Many of us have farmed too, many, too much clothing. We've got all kinds of stuff we don't need. We have houses that are too big, too big to even use properly or take proper care of, or else we have to work too hard to take care of them and to pay for them. In the modern world, excess tends to be the, the, way, the way of life. It's quite easy to be excessive in things because of technology. We're so highly developed that it's easy to be excessive in what we eat, what we wear, where we live. Even our medical industries are quite excessive. And so from this we can see one aspect of the results of doing the duties. That when we go too far one way, we can see what results we get. And they tend to be not very peaceful, not very happy, not very satisfying, not very healthy. Nowadays it's very difficult for us, very difficult to understand the Dhamma because we're so much deceived and tricked by advertising. We live in the industrial age and in this age of industry they use a lot of skill and talent to trick us, to deceive us. And because we're still, I'm sorry we have to say it this way, but because we're still so stupid, we believe all this stuff we hear and read in the advertising. If we were intelligent, we would realize that these are deceptions and lies. But because of our stupidity, we believe it all and we buy it all. So because of the power of industry and advertising in the modern world, it's very hard for us to understand Dhamma. Instead, we do everything excessively. It used to be good enough just to drive a little Volkswagen Beetle, but now they don't even make them anymore in some countries. You have to buy expensive Volkswagens with air conditioning and stereo radios and fancy headrests and all the rest. But more and more people aren't even satisfied with that. They've got to have a Mercedes-Benz or a Jaguar or whatever. People are no longer satisfied with just a house that protects them from the weather, that gives them a safe place to sleep at night. Nowadays, people have to build houses that cost a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, a million. There are nowadays many of us who, whose bathrooms cost more than an entire house used to cost. Just on bathrooms, people will spend ten, twenty, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars. Just in the toilet. This is the way things are because we're so stupid, we can't discriminate between the lies of advertising and the truth. And so we buy all this stuff and things are very excessive. This just goes to show that we we don't understand, we don't have any intelligence about the fruits of the duties to be done according to the law of nature. If we understood the duty and the fruits of the duties according to natural law, then we wouldn't have all these problems. We would know what is enough to have a peaceful, healthy, satisfying, truly spiritual life. But because we don't understand any of these things, excuse us for saying so, but because of our foolishness or our stupidity, we don't know what is right, what is correct, what is enough, what is healthy. And so we over and over again experience the fruits of doing the duties wrong. 
which are stress, tension, poor health, anxiety, nervousness, anger, and all the rest. This is the sad result of us being stupid about the duty according to natural law and the fruits of that duty. In correctness, there is neither lack nor excess. Or to put it in other words, there is neither positive nor negative. When things are correct, when life is correct, there is neither positive nor negative, which is to be divine, which is to be like God, because God is neither positive nor negative in any way. But nowadays, we like the positive. We worship the positive more than even God. You can find very few people who really worship God. Most of them are head over heels in love with the positive. And that means to be incorrect, to be wrong, to be out of kilter. But this is the way things are these days. Everybody's infatuated with the positive and could care less about what is right, what is correct, or with God. But what is correct is to neither attach to the positive nor to swing in the other direction and attach to the negative. But to be, to no longer be a slave to positive and negative, to be above the positive and the negative. This is what it means to be correct. Nowadays, we worship the positive so much that we can no longer worship God. When we're worshiping the positive, we can't worship God because God is beyond positive and negative. But nowadays we're worshiping the positive so much that we can't worship God. We don't know how to pray to God because we only pray to the positive. Whether this is true or not, please take a good look at your own life and see whether or not this is true. And because we're so infatuated with the positive, so much caught up with the positive and the negative, we can't live and practice according to the four principles of Dhamma. And when we can't live along these lines in harmony with these four principles, then our life is unconnected with Dhamma. We're disconnected from Dhamma, which means our lives are non-dharmic. Nowadays, our lives are not correct. We don't live correctly. We live out of harmony with these four principles of Dhamma. And so the result is that we have lives which are full of problems. And this is something that no intelligent person can deny because all around us are these signs of the incorrectness of our lives the way we dress, the way we treat each other, the way we destroy the environment, the way we oppress other people, the violence of our societies and our lifestyles, the imbalance, the overconsumption, and it's a very long list. The forms of mental illness, the strange diseases, the crime, and so on. Our lives are not correct, and the evidence for this is quite obvious. If anybody would stop to examine the evidence intelligently. But nobody does because we're so infatuated with the positive that we keep on heedlessly living these very incorrect, destructive lives. And so we can't understand these four principles of Dhamma 
and we can't live according to them. And this problem, this situation goes on and on, this incorrectness of our lives. And so when conditions are the way they are, when our ways of living are so drastically incorrect, then the, when our lives are so non-dharmic, then the dharmic life, the correct life is deeply hidden. The dharmic life is such a mystery to us because the way we live is so incorrect. The dharmic life is so profound, so difficult for us to understand simply because of the incorrectness of our way of living, which means of our ways of thinking. And so the result is that we go on living incorrectly, often without even thinking of doing anything about it. When we speak of being correct or right, we mean correct in line with the four principles of Dhamma. It's very simple that when we're correct, when we live correctly, when our way of living is correct in line with these four principles, then life is correct, then life is dharmic. But that means we must know these principles, understand them, and practice them. But now, we don't even care about these principles. All we care about is the positive, our pleasures, our fun. We don't care about these four principles, we totally ignore them. And so, of course, we don't understand them and we have no way of putting them into practice. When we ignore and fail to practice these principles, then our, then our lives are incorrect. And when our lives are non-dharmic, then the grace of God turns out to be pain and suffering. This is totally just. This is just the way things are according to nature and the law of nature. That we, li we live in ways that are incorrect, then the results will be nothing but dukkha, but pain, misery, stress, and suffering. Although many people are so incorrect, they don't even realize it. But this is the grace of God turns out this way, to be pain and suffering, because life, our lives are so non-dharmic. And nowadays it isn't enough for people to merely be incorrect in terms of these four principles of Dhamma that doesn't satisfy people to just be incorrect. Nowadays, they must rebel, they must pervert, and even blackmail the four principles of Dhamma. This is something we should take a look at. Now what we're talking about is that the arising of me and mine, of the misconcept of ego and self. This has taken over everything from nature. Our rebel the rebellion against nature is the rebellion of ego, of self. That takes everything to be me and mine. When it's all just nature, when it belongs merely to nature, ego rebels and very corruptly, very dishonestly takes it all over as me and mine. This is our rebellion against nature, against Dhamma. When the nervous system works, when the nervous system is functioning and the eye sees a form, we think, I see ego sees. When the ear hears a sound, 
we, we think, I hear, it's me hearing. When the nose smells fragrances, we take it to be, I smell. When the tongue tastes flavors, it's I taste. When the skin experiences touches, we take it to be I touch. When the mind thinks or feels or experiences, it's I think, I feel, I experience. This is how we rebel against nature, against Dhamma. Everything is taken to be I, to be me. This is due to the ignorance, to our ignorance of Dhamma, of nature, of the law of nature. We rebel and we very dishonestly, very crookedly take everything to be me and mine, to be ego and self. I don't think that the English words I and mine can fully convey the meaning of the Thai words Dua Gu and Kong Gu. Gu is a, a word that literally means I, but it has very crude, low, arrogant connotations. So when we say Dua Gu, one has a very arrogant, crude kind of ego. So if to translate this into English is difficult. The way many of us use the word ego in English is close to duagu, to that real strong, assertive, aggressive, arrogant, crude, me. That which we mean by ego comes close to duagu. So we must call it an arrogant I a crude I, a stupid, the stupid I, the stupid ego. And then Kongu means belonging to Gu. That means the equivalent of ego. So we could say maybe there's stupid I and there's stupid mind. There's arrogant I and arrogant mind. This is closer to the Thai words Duagu and Konggu. In the Pali language, there are two pairs of words on two levels. The first pair is the word Atta and Ataniya. Atta just means self, and Ataniya means connected or having to do with self. Atta and Ataniya are the ordinary level of I and mind. But when it becomes more intense, kind of hot and boiling, more anxious, then the Pali words are Ahangara and Mamamgara, which literally means something like I making and my making. So when it becomes very egoistic, the egoistic I and the egoistic mind, or what some of us call I go and my go. This cruder, more intense, more anxious level of I and mind is designated in Pali by Ahangara and Mamamgara. So notice these, the ordinary, not so bad I and mind and the really crude and dangerous egoistic I and egoistic mind. When life is on the level of this egoistic me and mind, the I making and my, the ego making and my go making, on this very crude level, this is when life is totally non-dharmic. It's totally out of harmony, out of line with Dharma. At first, life was just, just because of our ignorance, we took things to be self and belonging to self. But later this intensified, it gets worse, it becomes very strong, arrogant, proud. 
and then it's no longer simply self and belonging to self it becomes ego it becomes this arrogant crude very destructive ego and and the egoistic mind and this is when life has totally rebelled against dhamma on the one level it, it wasn't in harmony with it was non-dharmic but it hadn't gone totally overboard but when it becomes this ego and egoistic mind level then life is in total rebellion against nature and dhamma and then we end up with the very disastrous results that we experience nowadays now all of these low harmful destructive things that we've been talking about especially this very disastrous ego and egoism the way to deal with these is to understand dhamma in all four of its meanings because to include to understand those four meanings thoroughly will include the knowledge of how to live how to live in a way that is free of this these crude ugly evil things such as ego and egoism or egotism so we request and advise that you study dependent origination study itapajayata the law of interconnectedness interdependency interconditionality that governs all of nature or what is also called the law of dependent origination but teach us samupada please study this thoroughly until you understand it profoundly and then in order then you need to have mindfulness you need to have wisdom 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 that it can be applied or wisdom in action and a strong clear stable mind to do so in order to develop these mental qualities and abilities we encourage you to practice on anapanasati to under first of all to learn how to practice and then to use your time here to to practice it and understand it more deeply through trying it out which is what you'll be doing over at the meditation center so in order to deal with all these evil and disastrous effects of ego and egoism we encourage you to do your best to understand dependent origination and to dedicate yourselves to the practice of mindfulness with breathing so that you will have the ability to deal wisely and correctly with dependent origination with the facts of life so please do your best to study the laws of itapajayata interdependency and paticca samupada codependent origination as well as anapanasati mindfulness with breathing in and out please do your best to study these and practice them so that you will be able to find the life which is truly dharma and then life will be totally open instead of the dharmic life being hidden away a secret and mystery it will become something totally obvious and manifest so we encourage you to thoroughly study dependent origination and to dedicatedly practice on apanasati in order to have a thoroughly open and blossomed dharmic life so we we beg of you to study and practice on a panasati 
thoroughly and deeply. And then you will be able to master the stream of life so that it is always correct and, in, and correct in all aspects. And then all your problems will be over, your search will be finished. Last of all, we'd like to thank you for being very good listeners and you listened very well, very attentively. We thank you for your patience and we hope that it bears fruit in very successful study and practice and that your time here and the rest of your life helps you to discover the best thing there is to get in life.